Because the Torah was given at Mount Sinai on four uh, layers or four dimensions. One of them is called the secret dimension. The sod, the secret meaning behind every word and every idea in the Torah. And that was really kept secret even from uh, many of the great scholars. Only select among the scholars were allowed to delve into this uh, hidden or esoteric part of the Torah. Hasidus is the ultimate secret part of Torah that should no longer be a secret. Now, when we talk about secret, we don't mean some dangerous piece of information that uh, people should not be aware of. When we talk about secret part of Torah, we're talking about the most personal and the most intimate part of Torah. And the reason it's a secret is because it's sensitive, it's, it's precious, and it can be misunderstood. Not dangerously, just... Um, disappointingly. You know, like when people have a personal um, issue or subject that is close to their heart, it's their secret. So there's nothing dangerous about it. The only concern is, who do I share sensitive ideas with? Obviously, with sensitive people. And sensitive means uh, it, it won't be it won't be abused. If I share my secret with you, I trust that you will treat it with the respect and with the uh, proper uh, etiquette. And you won't, uh, you won't uh, make, it, make it public or make it uh, uh, insignificant. And that's why even great scholars without that sensitivity we're not, we're not invited into this sensitive area. So let's take a quick look in a, in, a, in a brief thumbnail sketch. What is the secret of Torah and uh, how is Chabad making it available? <clears throat> when we read the Torah on face value, like let's say the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not. I am God, your God. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It doesn't sound very personal. Although there is the statement that God's uh, a jealous God and therefore will not tolerate other gods. That's a bit of a personal insight into himself. But other than that, it just sounds like a list of do's and don'ts that are maybe uh, brilliant and vital to, uh, to life on earth, but certainly nothing sensitive. So that's the surface understanding of the Torah. As you get a little deeper, and as you go further in time, like in the times of the prophets, God becomes a little more personal. He tells us when he's upset and why he's upset and how upset he is. So it's becoming more personal, which means we're getting to see what is creation to him. We've gotten instruction on how we should live and what is important in our lives. But we didn't create the world. So what's in it for him? Why did he create the world? What investment does he have? What is his concern? Slowly, over the millennia, we, we get to see a little more of God's personal investment and his reaction to uh, the world becoming what he wants it to be or going in the wrong direction. So, just logically, in the beginning, there was just God. He alone existed because he is eternal, because he is infinite, because he's God. He is the original being. 
Then he created the world. The most logical, pertinent, relevant question is why. Why would a perfect being who has a perfect existence and uh, no trouble from his creations, why would he bother creating? What would disturb that perfect idyllic picture? There's just God, he's everywhere, he's everything, and there's no contradiction. He is one and only. There's no conflict, there's no, there's no, um, there's no division. It's all one and it's all wonderful. What disturbed that? What instigated the creation of the world? Well, if we study Hasidic philosophy, and even if you go back to, to Kabbalah, we get to understand that there can't be anything that instigates God's behavior. Nothing can motivate him because nothing existed besides him. So when people say God created the world because he wanted to be kind to his creations, but there were no creations and there was no kindness, there was just him. So to say kindness motivates God, that, that's, not, that's not acceptable. God created kindness, like on the first day of creation. God said, let there be light, that's kindness. Others say that God created the world because God is a king and a king needs subjects. But that too is not a really satisfying answer because when did God become a king? That's a description of a role that God takes on in creation. It can't be the motivator for creation. God doesn't need to be a king. So if you go back, just logically, there's God himself and nothing else. What happened? So if we use a simple, familiar experience, a human being, fast asleep, deep sleep, perfect sleep, totally restful, you know, un unaware of any disturbances or any discomforts, why would anybody wake up? You have this idyllic, perfect condition. Why, why do we wake up? You know, assuming there's no crying baby or the crowing rooster to disturb your sleep, why would we wake up? Of course, the answer is because you want to, because there's something you want to do. In other words, what disturbs a perfect condition? An internal desire. It can't be something from the outside because you've blocked everything from the outside. And in God's case, there was no outside. There was nothing else. Which means that whatever it is that God wants, he wants it essentially. Because there are no details in God. There's just him. Essence. Ultimate essence. So whatever it is that God is after, must be part of his very essence. So can he be after becoming a king over people? That doesn't sound very essential. Uh, anything else we can think of, out of kindness, out of creativity, out of the desire to be revealed and known, none of this really satisfies the question. So now here's what we're told. The secret of Torah is that every commandment in the Torah, every word in the Torah, is essentially Him. That's Him. Shabbos is Him, Tefillin is Him, Mikveh is Him. That's Him. 
So when he reveals himself at Mount Sinai, which is called a revelation, what is he revealing? His essential being. In creation, God conceals his essential being. And that's why we have to be reminded that there's a creator to the world. Because the world uh, kind of makes you forget. Gives the impression that it was not created and didn't need to be created. So of course we can discover God through nature. But by realizing that this could not have created itself. So it's a process of elimination that leads us to the conclusion that there must be a creator. But it doesn't tell us why he created the world. The Torah does. Because again, every word in Torah is a description of his essential self. Because nothing else exists yet. So the Torah is literally him. That's the secret of Torah. And that's contained in the Zohar, in the Kabbalah, where it says, God and his Torah are one. Torah is not a product that God creates, it's him. That, <clears throat> that is his essential, internal, intimate, personal being. Now, he creates a world and gives us the Torah. You know, an example. God creates the world in six days and he rests on the seventh day because the seventh day is special to him. Always was and always will be. But then he creates us and says, rest on the seventh day like I do. So what is he saying? He's saying, I am all about Shabbos and I need you to join me in that Shabbos. So he's taking the mitzvahs that are essentially himself and giving it to us or inviting us to participate in his mitzvah. Now, if somebody gives you a, a part of himself that is so essential and so intimate that you cannot separate them, where there's God, there is Shabbos. Where there is Shabbos, there is God. It's him. And yet he gives it to you. When someone shares his most intimate self with you, what does that tell you about what he thinks of you? Very much like a man asking a woman to marry him. It's not about some activity. It's not about something. It's the essence of me needs the essence of you to be joined together. That's the secret. The secret is the world was created out of God's need, not out of our need, because we don't need this. So why was it kept secret for so long? Because if a person is somewhat insensitive, a little callous, a little jaded, when God comes and says, this is really about my need, we might have the tendency to lose respect. You know, like um, uh, Groucho Marx's joke about, I would never join a country club that would accept me as a member. <laughs> Some people would say, a God who needs me, I've lost all respect for him. But that's so insensitive. And so most scholars in every part of the world teach an invulnerable God, a God that can't need anything. And that's why he's God, because you're needy, but he is not. And so you worship him because he has all the answers. He has all the keys. Everything is his. And he doesn't need you, but you desperately need him. That's, that's been the picture for uh, most of history. To tell the world, to tell the average person in the street, God actually needs you far more than you need him. 
because you didn't create yourself, you didn't ask to be created, you didn't need to be created. And whatever needs you have, they're only going to last 80, 90, 100 years, and then you won't need them anymore. So at best, it's temporary. At worst, it's a headache. The need to eat three times a day, it's disturbing. So who really needs? Who is really invested in this vast eternal plan? And for people who want to fix the world, tikkun olam, very nice of you to want to fix the world, but imagine you want to fix the world? How much does God who created it want to fix the world? So if you feel that need, imagine how much he feels it. So every mitzvah we do now takes on a whole new meaning. When we say serve God with joy, we're saying two amazing things. First of all, you can serve God. Now, if he needed nothing, if he was invulnerable and needed nothing, how do you serve him? Can you serve him? So if he is this perfect God that you worship because he is above and beyond all needs, and that's why you're going to serve him, but now you can't serve him because he doesn't need you. So saying serve God with joy tells us, if we can see the secret meaning behind those words, that he is actually depending on us. And when we do a mitzvah, we are literally serving his need, his vast eternal plan. The second thing we're saying is serve God with joy. If you want to be happy, and this goes back to what you were describing about the search for meaning, why do human beings have to find meaning? What's wrong with, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow you'll die? <laughs> What's wrong with that? Why are we always looking for meaning as if we have to justify our existence? <laughs> because because we do have to justify our existence. Because we didn't need to exist for ourselves. So why did he create us and why are we here? It's a very good question. The answer is, if you serve God, you will find joy because it will answer these questions that you were looking that you were asking it'll tell you where you belong in the scheme of things it'll tell you how you are indispensable to him it'll tell you what he needs from you and this is your purpose and this is your objective and this is your contribution and now you're a partner with him in creation everything starts to make sense Everything goes better with Torah. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in. Things go better with mitzvahs. So that is the secret. Now, recently, like for the last 200 years or so, the, uh, the leaders, the, the Rebbes of Chabad, made it their business to reveal this secret in as sensitive a way as possible to avoid the, um, the negative reaction of the insensitive, which it can't be avoided completely, but the, the Rebbe decided that it's, it's worth the risk. Yes, some people will take it wrong, some people will be put off, by a vulnerable God. But the average person will be inspired and that will reinvigorate Judaism, get us back on track, serving God properly with the ultimate pure intention, responding to his need rather than being needy and, and uh, demanding things of him constantly. So. We have a God who we can serve, not a God who we expect to serve us. And that really will save us from our narcissism, from our pettiness, and from our meaninglessness. So you really have come to the right 
to the right address to find answers to those questions. As a rule, people who know nothing about Judaism, when they're told God depends on you and waits for you to do the mitzvah, the reaction is so beautiful. It's so intimate. And yes, God is vulnerable because vulnerability comes from strength and he is almighty. So if he is the strongest of the strong, he must be the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And that's what makes it possible to serve him, to love him, to partner with him. He is not a distant being. He created us because in his essence, he wants to be connected to us. That sound uh, like a good secret to share? So even as we share it, we treat it like a secret. In other words, we treat it with, with kid's gloves. We're careful about it. We try to uh, make it clear that this is a vulnerable and sensitive part of Torah. And that, yeah, you have to be a little noble and sensitive to appreciate it. And those who are bothered by it, we have to take the risk. So welcome to the secret society. <laughs> Rabbi, if I could ask you. Yeah. Uh, well, something you said in the latter half about uh, the Rebbe saying it's a risk to do this. Looking, you know, looking back, uh, well, and looking forward, I guess, too, has it been worth the risk? Absolutely. It has revolutionized and reinvigorated Jewish life all over the world for the last 200 years, including Russia. Despite all the attempts of this awesome dictatorship, Judaism not only has survived communism, it thrives in Russia. And what motivates it, what animates it, what gets it excited is the fact that we are serving God. And when you're serving God, nothing gets in your way. No dictator can discourage it. So yes, it has been magnificently successful everywhere, wherever it was applied and is being applied. Last question on my end. You know, I'm 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 coming from a you know from a formerly secular perspective, even though that that's not the greatest label in the world to use. And and I, I do see some of my you know uh, I'll just say my colleagues, my peers, uh, connecting with Hustidus in in the same way that I do. And so the question is. Uh, why, why do you think Hasidus is able to connect so well with the secular folks once they've been properly introduced to Hasidus? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Because you would expect that this would be the furthest thing from their, from their uh, world view. You know, I, I, I'm going to add to your question a little bit. Sometimes I'm talking to people who insist that they don't believe in God at all. We talk about how God is vulnerable and, mot and the motivation for creation comes from his very essence so that the mitzvah is essential to him and that it can't be any other way. This is it. This is the essence of everything. It is the ultimate truth. And God is waiting for you to do the mitzvah. And all of a sudden, these people who were convinced that they don't believe in God, 
want to serve him. And I think part of the secret is that there's, there's something natural within us. Since we were created to serve, we have a natural instinct that finds the idea familiar, like intuitively familiar. I am here to serve him. Why does that sound right? Why does that sound comfortable? It could be because I really don't want to serve myself. That's narcissism. And, and, and that's a dead end, literally a dead end. Drives people to suicide. So I don't want to serve myself. If God, the creator of everything, needs me to serve him, that sounds so correct. That sounds so fitting that all of a sudden they're not atheists anymore. They, they rejected the idea of a God that is invulnerable, sits in heaven and then pulls strings and watches people go through their difficulties in life and he's unaffected by it. That kind of a God, I don't know why anybody would want to believe in. But once you introduce the idea that God is far more invested in you and, and is more vulnerable than you are. That's the kind of a God that, that we intuitively recognize as correct. Also because, as it turns out, human beings at their very essence need to be needed. So that's where you're asking questions about what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? What's wrong with just being here? Human beings have been on earth at least 5,000 years. Why, why are we uncomfortable? Why don't we settle down? Why are we still looking for an excuse to be here? It's because essentially we are created to serve. We are created out of a need. So all we need is to know who needs us and what we're needed for. That just talks to some core truth within the human being. And that's what religion is supposed to be. Or we shouldn't even call it religion. Religion has become a way of eliciting goodies and blessings and, and spiritual benefits from God. That's what religion has become. If I do this, will I get to heaven? If I do this, will God love me and make me rich? If I do this, will I be among the saints when they come marching in? And if not, well then, I'm not interested. What we're saying now is the exact opposite. The question is not what you can get from following the commandments. The question is, what does he get from this? How much am I doing for him? And the answer is infinite meaning, infinite pleasure, because God is infinite. So that takes you to a whole different world, a whole different reality. And all the questions fall away. With this one answer, all the other questions disappear. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.